So here we all are. And Paula, could you see the meeting room, uh, the waiting it, room? It just showed up again. Okay, so you're in charge of making sure. <laughs> now this is weird. Oh, I don't know why there was for a moment a blue streak through the um, hummingbird. Oh. But that seems to have gone away. Um, I have to figure out how to make this all disappear. Okay. So thank you all for coming tonight. And thank Paula Lozano for helping. Um, let me see. I have to figure out how. Uh, Paul, uh, Paula is a friend of mine. We go back to the 90s. And um, she's going to be my co-host letting people in. And she'll stop me if there's some sort of emergency in the waiting room or somebody has an urgent question. Otherwise, we'll open sound at the end so everybody can ask questions or whatever. Um, And tonight we're talking about August, because that happens to be the month we're in. And um, birds are different in August than just about any time of year. Some birds are already in the middle of their migration. They've already come a thousand miles or more from their breeding grounds, and those are almost all shorebirds. They breed way up on the tundra, and have to clear out before the weather gets bad up there. Of course, they have not read any of the reports about climate change, which may make things really dicey up there. And they probably don't need to leave as early as they have been, but this is when they go. If you're seeing shorebirds now, most of them came from the far north already. Some birds are right this moment, exactly where they'll be in January. The chickadee I'm pointing to is an adult. I don't know if it's the mother or the father, but it's going to be in my yard in January. But this chickadee is the baby and it will not be in my yard in January. The baby chickadees are still hanging out with their parents and their siblings. This is the only time of year in July and early August when you can see chickadees sitting side by side like this. Today I had six chickadees in my spruce tree all in the same few branches but I did not have my camera with. Uh, this is the only time when they're tolerant of being this close because they're siblings and parents. But as soon as the babies start finding out that they can get all their own food and figure out that their parents are not going to feed them anymore, they're going to lose interest in their whole family and start moving away and joining another flock that is not related to them. Each baby will join a totally different flock for the winter. So this is our last chance to be seeing chickadee families. The adults are molting now and some of them are going to soon look as pretty as their babies. Some birds are just starting nesting. Either they started in July or they are even waiting until now to nest. And our two latest nesters are the cedar waxwing and the goldfinch. Goldfinches eat thistle and they build their nests from it. Thistle is like this perfect plant for goldfinches. Right now, it is in full seed in my neighbor's yard across the street. I took this picture last night. Uh, and this is the building material for goldfinch nests. And I showed some of these pictures last time of how tightly woven their nest is because they use that fragile, thin thistle 
to weave it all together. And so it's a nice tight nest. And goldfinches uh, feed their babies mostly seeds. And the babies just love seeds, but that's why if a cowbird lays its egg in a goldfinch nest, the baby cowbird is not going to fledge. It's not going to survive that long. Cowbirds need a lot of animal protein from insects and uh, goldfinches just haven't got that memo. So they feed their babies all these mushed up seeds. They're supposed to be vegans, but some have not gotten that message. Jill Henry let me gave me permission to use this picture of hers of a goldfinch who's picking aphids off the leaves. And I've watched goldfinches take mayflies. So I know that they break the rules of veganhood, but they just do not get enough insects to keep a cowbird alive. Cedar waxwings have this beautiful little nest um, I don't know if I can go, yeah, I can go backward now. And they have these beautiful babies, but this one is not feeding its baby an insect. It's feeding it, uh, probably it looks like a cherry, but they feed their babies lots of fruit. And again, that doesn't have enough protein to keep baby cowbirds alive. So if a cowbird nests and uh, lays its egg in a cedar waxwing nest, that baby cowbird is not going to survive either. But they have plenty of work just raising their own little baby cedar wax wings. And it's cool that the insides of their mouth are the same color as the cherries they eat. And the babies look so adorable. And pretty soon, by the end of the month, we're going to be seeing collections of wax wings. This includes adults. Those are the ones with the clear breasts. And, we're, and there's babies here. They're the ones with the streaked breasts. And they sally out to get insects that are flying. But they also eat fruit. And we'll be able to see them doing both things this month. In July and August, birds look their absolute best, like this adorable, perfect looking chickadee, but they also, and this perfect looking baby blue jay, but they can also look their absolute worst. I used this picture last time too, of this chickadee who's in full song. He's a father chickadee, still raising his babies and teaching them their song, but his feathers are all a full year old. And those feathers have seen better days. And so one by one, he has to replace them. And that's why he wants his children to hurry up and grow up so he can focus on that project next. Blue Jay adults do not look their best either. For some reason, Blue Jays and Cardinals, some individuals molt all their head feathers simultaneously and look horrible for a week or two. I had two baby blue jays that I raised one year. Well, I had one as an education bird for many years and the other one ended up not being releasable and I kept that one for several years. And every year my sneakers molted all her head feathers together looking like this. And meanwhile, BJ molted his head feathers just one by one, so you didn't see the transition. And no one knows why some blue jays do this, but they look pretty amusing. This brown thrasher was in my neighbor's yard. It's an adult. You can tell that by the really brown forehead and the gold eye. But its feathers are starting to get ratty looking. and. Uh, some of them have already fallen out, so they're not properly covering the gray. Their feathers are mostly downy gray, and the tip is that beautiful rusty color on their back. The gray part is the insulation that's not supposed to show, but this time of year when they're molting, 
we're seeing those openings. And if you want to see this particular bird look really bad, here he looks like he's about to die, but he's laying in the sunny place right next to a place where he can quick duck in and hide, and he's sunning. And birds do this. They flop over on their side, open their mouth like this, look like they're on death's door, and that's accentuated because the sun is directly on them, making their pupil as tiny as it can be. And they're heating up their feathers and their skin. And by doing that, they're banishing the mites and lice that were on their feathers and skin. And here's a robin doing the same thing. Birds quiet down in August. Uh, this particular robin is my backyard robin, uh, the same bird as this one actually, who has uh, raised at least three batches of young now in my yard this year. But he today sang a song that lasted maybe three seconds. It wasn't a whole long sentence of a Robin song. It was more of a phrase, and then he either forgot what he was doing or got busy with something else. We're not hearing Robins and Wrens doing all the singing that they were doing just a couple of weeks ago. But red-eyed vireos have a resurgence of singing in late summer and we even can hear them singing away in September. So I have no idea why they do that. Some birds are learning or practicing their songs as they migrate. This is two white-throated sparrows from my yard this spring. The bird on the left is the white striped form. Whether it's a male or a female, it sings. The bird on the right is a tan striped individual. If it's a male, he sings. But if it's a female, she does not sing. In the fall, we think it's mostly the babies that are practicing, but it might be some of the adults every now break into song. But it's like they just don't have the hormonal push that they have in spring, and the songs can sound really bad. Um, my husband is still taking bike rides, and when he goes along one bike path, he's still hearing uh, white-throated sparrows singing. They're the species that made international news for changing their song from old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody to uh, yeah, sure, you bet, you bet, you bet, you bet. Uh, for some reason, birds in the West through most of the way to the East Coast now are singing doublets rather than triplets in their song. And people are still trying to figure out how they share this new idea of a song. And when the young birds are still hearing their parents singing the old song and hearing other birds' parents singing the new song, how they decide they prefer the new one. No one has figured that out. Molting is something that happens in July and August. It's easiest when food is abundant and they're closing down the raising of their babies and they can just focus on growing new feathers before all the arduous work of migration. I took this picture yesterday in my yard of a grackle who is getting all new really black feathers. I'm not sure if this is a, a young bird from last year or if it's a young bird from this year. Its feathers are not adult feathers that you know just got um, too much sun over the year. It had brownish feathers and now they're coming in black. But this is what birds are doing now, but they're so quiet that if you don't pay attention to them, you don't notice that. Fresh feathers are very useful before a long journey. And hummingbirds are gonna be working their way to the uh, Gulf of Mexico now. And they want to have pretty new feathers for that. But feathers are also going to be useful 
for birds that aren't going to mi be migrating, but need good insulation when winter comes. That right now they'll be replacing all their outer feathers, what we call their contour feathers. And then as we start getting colder nights underneath those feathers, they're gonna be growing in a lot of down feathers to give them a lot of insulation for the winter. A few birds do not molt up here at all. The common loon cannot fly if it's missing any wing feathers. Uh, this is one of my favorite mathematical puzzles about birds. Great blue herons have a 65 to 79 inch wingspan where common loons, their wingspan is only 40 to 51 inches. So the biggest wingspan on a common loon is way less than the shortest wingspan on a great blue heron. But the loon weighs a lot more. The lightest loon weighs as much as the heaviest great blue heron, and both of them weigh about what a newborn baby weighs. A great blue heron weighs uh, about the same as um, like an eight-month preemie. Uh, common loons can weigh, a, you know, more than a newborn baby weighs. For Here's my exhibit A. This is my firstborn baby, Joey, on October 11th, 1981, when he only weighed 7.8 pounds, where these guys, uh, a great blue heron, weighs more than two pounds less than a newborn baby with that ginormous wingspan. And the common loon, its tinier wings have to hold up a much heavier body. If they're missing just one flight feather, they don't have enough area on their wings to hold up their bodies. So what they do is wait until they get to the ocean. Most of our loons go to the Atlantic coast or to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's not until they get into salt water that they molt their feathers. They, if they encounter an enemy in the ocean, they could just swim away. But in the, but it takes a long time to replace all those wing feathers, and so they do it when they have the leisure to do it on the ocean. This time of year, it's hard work to be finishing off babies. I took this picture on July 11th of a blue jay, uh, this is a baby blue jay insisting on food, and there were at least five babies in that little family, and the parents were attending to each one and working really hard. I took this picture, and this is actually a younger baby than those. I took this picture this Thursday. His parents or her parents must have lost their first uh, nest and started all over again. So they're at least two weeks later than that earlier brood. And the parents are just working themselves ragged, trying to feed the babies and help them all grow up. Parent blue jays bond with each of their babies and they seem to actually mourn or grieve the loss of any of them. So it's a lot of energy they put into raising these little ones. This is a baby Lacan sparrow that's close to us and you can see the mother or the father in the background a little higher. Uh, I took this last August in Port Wing, Wisconsin and our co-host tonight, Paula Lozano, was with me when I took this picture and helping me to try to hear the birds because their song is outside of my hearing range now but I got lots of baby Lacan Sparrow pictures. They're, they're even 
I don't know if they're more adorable than their parents, but they're pretty darn cute. This is a chipping sparrow baby that I took yesterday in my backyard. And the parent chipping sparrows are also running themselves ragged. I had a whole lot of cowbirds this spring, but I have not seen any of my baby birds, my song sparrows or my chippies, feeding cowbirds, so I'm very relieved. Baby robins are very insistent, but by the time they're, um, they're, the next nest has uh, hatched, these guys can get all their own food and they stop running their dad ragged. But this is still a pretty young guy. Not only is he all speckled, but you can see yellow where his bill meets his face. That's part of his gape. That will all slowly um, just uh, atrophy as his beak gets firm and hard there. But they're just hopping on lawns and doing what they see their parents doing. Baby flickers, this is the parent who's getting a lot of food. Baby flickers sometimes start following their parents on the ground eating ants. And I forgot to throw in a picture of a baby with this one. But here's a baby sitting up in my tree. He sat up there for over an hour while I was taking pictures. I have no idea when he first arrived there. And it wasn't until his parents started calling that he flew two doors away where his parent was going to feed him. But um, baby flickers are, look very clueless but alert. And here he is sticking his tongue out, tasting what wood tastes like, I don't know if he sees a little bug in the crevice, but it was really fun just watching him sitting up there trying to figure out the world. They're very bewildered, easy pickings if a hawk notices them, and very vulnerable. So the parents are ever vigilant, plus the parents are always desperately trying to get enough food for the little guys. This is a red-eyed vireo who's feeding a cowbird. And Becca Mullenberg uh, sent me this photo uh, yesterday or today. And I'm very relieved that I didn't see any parents feeding cowbirds this year. Cowbirds uh, very, very often parasitize red-eyed vireo nests. Unfortunately, I didn't have any red-eyed vireos in my yard this year. Last year, crows raided the nest, and I think the female red-eyed vireo must have remembered that and wanted no part of my yard. So I've had a male singing on and off, but never for more than a couple days in a row, and then he disappears for several, uh, for a week or more, because he can't attract the female there. Loons and hummingbirds have something in common, and this is the time of year we notice it. First of all, they both have exactly two babies, and that's how many are in a nest. Now, hummingbirds, if she raises her first brood fine and still has enough time, she'll produce a second and once in a while, even a third nest up here, loons only raise the two. If they lose the eggs early on, they may try again. But if they lose their chicks, it's usually beyond the period when they're hormonally capable of starting over again. But hummingbirds and loons raise two babies and both of them depend on a food supply that can dwindle by summer's end. So whether they're eating flowers, which, you know, in a drought year, they can totally run out of nectar, or whether they're feeding the babies fish and a lake had an algal bloom or something and had a fish decline, if the parents stay with the young, they're going to be using up a lot of the food that the young need. So in both cases, the parents laid out for the territory before the chicks do. With hummingbirds right now, the males 
are migrating. Right now, we're going to get a big resurgence of activity at our feeders, and a lot of it is going to be adult males. But in another week or two, the males will be entirely gone, and the only hummingbirds remaining will be females and the babies of either sex. And the females will light out as soon as their bodies have enough fat to make the journey. The babies, one by one, will leave, but not until they have enough body fat that they can travel. It's like they have a signal in their brain that switches on. Today's the day of the marathon, the moment their bodies have enough fat. Loons, uh, the only loons that remain on the, on the nesting lakes in late summer are the babies. And one by one, they have to be able to take off. And remember, they have a heavy body and their wings have to have all the surface area that they need to lift up their bodies so they cannot even try to migrate until they've grown in all their flight feathers to full length. And then they need a headwind to take off. And if we get a long still period and then some frozen nights where lakes freeze over before the loons could take off, some of the babies end up iced in. But usually it all works out fine. The parents leave first, that leaves all the fish for the babies. And as soon as their feathers are all the way developed in, they can migrate too. Other than that, loons and hummingbirds do not have a lot in common. But they both have something ruby on their bodies, either their throat, if they're a male hummingbird, or their eye. That red eye, by the way, fades in the, when they get to the salt water. And even sometimes in, the, in August, before they migrate, their eye will get duller without the hormones of spring to get them ruby red. There's lots and lots and lots of food right now, and birds are uh, the place we see the birds lurking is in fruit trees and fruit shrubbery. And they tend to be pretty quiet when they're eating. It's either parents with their young or individual birds, but they're not territorial now, and it's best for them to be very quiet. Brown thrashers spend a lot of time lurking in fruit trees. And here's a baby from this year. So it doesn't have the rich, soft brown on the head. And its eye isn't that vivid yellow. Catbirds also lurk in the fruit trees. Um, both of them will come to jelly sometime, as will Orioles. They're more likely to come to jelly than anything else at feeders in the fall. Once in a while, they also like suet. Waxwings come to eat a lot of fruit. I get them in my mountain ash trees. I get them in my dogwood. They just love eating berries. Birds, this is the time of year when birds really come to bird baths. And if you have a, a, a dripping one, this is a recirculating little tiny pond that I got. I forget where we ordered it from, either Amazon or Walmart quite a, um, a few years ago. But this year it broke. It, it, the electrical power, it just kept breaking the circuit and not circulating. So I finally had to give up my perfect bird bath. So I replaced it, but I still get cool birds. And uh, this is from several summers ago. In 2016, um, Russ had cancer surgery in August. I don't know why my computer is making a funny noise, but um, 
he was just feeling miserable the day we came back from the hospital. And that next morning, after a miserable night, we both woke up to the sound of evening grosbeaks. We had 16 of them in our yard. And they stayed for two full weeks. And one of their favorite places was the bird bath. Robins are the most voracious bathers and water drinkers you could find. So I've had lots of opportunities to take pictures. This is that same male. He just lets me come right up and take his pictures and poses. Would you prefer this angle? So he's been quite a joy this year. Here's one of his batches of babies. Uh, this was with my, uh, I had a bird cam, but it seems to have died too. So I don't have a cam right now on my bird bath to take pictures when I'm not looking. But I got this one spring and I couldn't find all my fall my August warbler pictures, but I've had Nashvilles and Blackburnians and all kinds of birds. This bird bath, the bottom part was way too deep. The top part, that's a, a solar bubbler thing on top, but the bottom part cracked and we had to get rid of it, but the top part still worked. So I put that in a cat litter box and you'll see that later. Um, Swainson's thrushes very often come to my bird bath. And here's a Blackburnian warbler. This year, okay, here's that top of that one bird bath, and now it's in a kitty litter box. And I put in stones so little tiny birds could use it too. The baby blue jays figured it out. I got that picture on the right yesterday. And I also bought a shallow bird bath with a spritzer. It just sprays water like that. And I bought one stand for the bird bath, but I bought two shallow bird baths. And as the water reaches, it's at just enough of a tilt that the water in the top will start running off into the lower bird bath. And I'm hoping that will replace my other bird bath by the raspberries for all the warblers. But a blue jay figured this one out yesterday, so I was pretty happy about that. Uh, chippies come to him, and um, my yard also has a couple of other cool features. I have something that calls in evening grosbeaks if they happen to be over. Evening grosbeaks have declined dangerously. When we moved to Duluth in 1981, the very first bird on my yard list was evening grosbeaks. There was a whole flock calling and nobody even had a bird feeder at my house, but we have box elder trees and these are box elder seeds and that is one of an evening grosbeak's favorite foods. As soon as we set out the feeders, they started eating sunflower seeds too. I was pregnant when we moved here and after we had our three kids and they started making it possible to rent a video camera, every now and then we'd rent one and take little movies of our kids. And in the background of every single outdoor movie we took of the kids and a lot of the indoor ones, even with the windows closed, you can hear evening grosbeaks in the soundtrack. They were abundant 12 months of the year with a tiny bit fewer in June, but then they came with the babies by July and through August, they were everywhere. We would go through 200 pounds of sunflower seeds a month when we had evening growth speaks. Uh, this is the flock that came in when Russ was recovering from his surgery in 2016. And you can tell the adults 
in the summer because they have green beaks. The babies know they can get food from any evening gross beak that happens to have a green beak, whether it's a male or a female. So you can see the three closest birds are young ones. They don't have that green. And you probably can't hear this, but there's three, uh, the, the bird closest I think is an adult female, the two between are young birds, and then there's the male in back. And they were just letting me hang out the window. We, uh, there was a side window and I was just hanging out, taking the video, and the birds were cool with that. It was just such a perfect thing because Russ really loves evening grosbeaks and really missed them. But this was the last time. Oh, this wasn't 2016. It was 2012. And I think this is the one where one of the babies tries to figure out the window. And so I think a baby's going to fly in and look at his image in the window and try and figure out what the glass is all about. Yeah, here it is, trying to figure out that glass. But yeah, I was heartbroken when my evening grow speaks disappeared. This year, I got one evening grow speak calling when I was making my recordings, when I would, you know, get up at four in the morning, set out my recorder and go back to bed or do whatever I had to do. I was listening to one of the recordings and one day I had an evening grow speak, but it's heartbreaking that we don't get the big numbers anymore. But they sure filled us with joy. And they're very peaceable as long as they just have a little bit of personal space. In the winter time, no evening gross beaks have green beaks. And so that's more of a chalky white color. And they look a little clueless when they're babies. Watch your hummingbird feeders now. We're starting to get the adult males migrating through and the females and young that live right in our neighborhood. But you never know when an outlier is going to appear. I took this picture on August 11th, 2007 in Northern Wisconsin, they had what they thought was a weird ruby-throated hummingbird, but it was a rufous hummingbird, or at least it belonged to the genus Salasphorus. And this one I saw in my backyard. It was the only time I ever left out my hummingbird feeder into November. And this bird appeared November 16, 2004, and stuck around until December 3rd, 2004. And it was a fairly mild November, but we had nights when it got down into the um, teens and low 20s. And every morning before sunrise she would be back at my feeder and so we I would bring the food in at night so it would be room temperature when I put it out in the morning and I had several feeders some were just sugar water I ordered the kind of food that people feed hummingbirds in aviaries 
but it didn't arrive until the day she departed. Meanwhile, I ground up some mealworms in my blender and mixed them with sugar water in some of the feeders. And the first time she went to one of those feeders, she tasted it and flew away. But after about a half hour, she came back and then she spent about half her time at that feeder and half her time at the one right outside my window, this one, which was just sugar water. It was cold. And so I made the sugar water a little stronger than I would do in the summer. I made it about a third of a cup of sugar per cup of water. And we had a blizzard on December 2nd, and it was heartbreaking. I was so worried about her. I wore my snow pants and jacket in my upstairs office where this window is and had one of the windows cranked open all day so she could come in and warm up a little bit if she wanted. She flew in once right to the center of the room up by the ceiling and rotated her body around looking every which way and she apparently decided well she's no martha stewart and she flew back out the window and she only came in a couple of other times but she didn't light or try to rest in the cool room well that night the temperature got down uh, in single digits. I think it got down to eight when I went to bed and our house was creaking the way our old houses do when you're first getting severe cold. And I knew that in the morning I was going to have to go out and search under every shrub to try and find her little body. But in the morning I got up went to my office and she was at the window before light. I put out the food. She pigged out all morning and it was a sunny, calm day after that bitter cold. And she pigged out until mid morning and around 10 o'clock, she was gone and never came back. And I was just hoping against hope that she would find feeders somewhere along the way because the rufous hummingbirds that are overwintering now in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania and all kinds of places in the East where they do not belong, according to the field guides, those birds seem to have very good survival rates. And as we're losing more of their natural habitat in Mexico, where they're supposed to be spending their winter, the ones who work out a better system for them are lucking into maybe a new pattern for Rufus hummingbirds. So keep an eye on your feeders just in case you have an outlier. Of course, there's some very rare species who also show up at our hummingbird feeders now and then. I took this picture yesterday, uh, two day, uh, three days ago now. I do not know how to break my squirrels of that naughty habit. Last night we had a bear, but that bear hadn't figured out hummingbird feeders. They used to destroy my poor mother-in-law's hummingbird feeders because a lot of bears do have a sweet tooth, but um, the bear who's been breaking into our yard has not figured that out yet. So um, I think that's all the pictures I have. And so we have, lots of extra time for questions. Next time, I'm going to be talking about migration strategies. That'll be on September 1st, because there's all different ways that different species get from here to there. And so that's it for questions. And let me figure out how to get back into regular. Um, where's, where am I now? I can't find me. So, I see. You see what? I see you. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so, uh, any questions, anyone?
They might have to unmute themselves. Yeah, you'll have to unmute yourself to talk, but I think you should be able to. Right? Do I have... Oh, allow participants to unmute themselves. Yes, Hi. so now you should be able to. Polly. Yes. <laughs> I, my timer just went off for my blueberry pie. Our daughter brought blueberries. So anyway, I was wondering about the evening grow specs. Do you know any reason why? Because I was so sad, too, when they quit coming. Uh, yes, I've actually looked into it quite a bit. They, um, they seem to have declined because we've changed how we manage forests. We used to grow in the northern forests in Canada, northern Minnesota, and all the places of their natural range. We used to manage forests mostly for what we call saw lumber. That would be the trees that have hard wood that we could use to build houses and log cabins and furniture. But as we've made the switch more from saw lumber to wood products so that we're making more plywood and press board and all that stuff mm -hmm. and growing forests for more paper, we're growing more of the soft woods. And those are worthless for evening grow speaks. They want box elder seeds and maple seeds and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's got to do partly at least with forest management. Of all birds, evening grow speaks are also one of the most vulnerable to um, window strikes. Mm. And um, I have no idea why. In winter, they're one of the birds who are attracted to roadside salt. And you can, one logging truck or just somebody's car can plow down 30, 40 at once when you have a whole big flock because they're extremely sociable. So uh, it all seems to have things to do with how we're managing the forests and it's pretty heartbreaking. Yes. Laura? Yeah? Could yeah. I ask you a question about cedar waxwings? Sure. I never thought of this before. I knew they were late nesters. And mm -hmm. are they, the goldfinches are waiting for the thistle, we've always been told. Are the waxwings waiting for the fruit to ripen? Yeah. Okay. It's that easy, huh? Okay. Yeah, they like bugs, but they also like fruit. And it may partly be a strategy to avoid cowbirds, too. Oh. But um, because, you know, there aren't that many cowbirds still laying eggs at the time that waxwings and goldfinches start nesting. Some mm -hmm. song sparrows have a late nest. They can nest two or three times in the summer, and chipping sparrows can re-nest like that. And so cowbirds, they can lay just a bizarre number of eggs. I think the, the record that we know about is like 56 eggs. And she could only lay one, in, uh, one a day. Each day she ovulates a single egg and has to deposit it. But that means she's laying eggs over two full months. And um, so it's, it's hard to understand. It's just really cool. The more I learn about birds, the cooler they are. They are. Could I ask a question on migration? Sure. I was curious how the baby birds know where they're going. It depends on what species. Some of them learn it from their parents. This is something I'm going to talk about a lot next month. But like baby whooping cranes, remember the project Operation Migration had where they learned their migration from following an ultralight with somebody in it that they thought was their parent because he was wearing a costume. Um, Canada geese stay with their parents and learn their migration. Some birds just have it programmed in their brain. And that would be the hummingbirds and loons. But so, and some birds like robins will join flocks and the babies are pretty clueless, but they just do what everybody else does, and the grown-ups are the ones taking the lead. With hummingbirds, 
it's just in their brain and it's a powerful mm -hmm. instinct there is a cruel myth that you have to bring in your hummingbird feeders by labor day weekend or they will stay too long and die but that is totally not true what happens is they know they have to migrate. Their bodies tell them when they're ready to migrate. They need a lot of body fat in order to fly long distances. So Laura? they, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for my label that says I'm with stupid instead uh -huh. of I will pre David did that and I can't figure out how to change it <laughs> about the hummingbirds um, I know you said that the males leave first and and so likely the ones that we see later on are the females are the young ones now I live in st. Louis and I usually see hummingbirds up until mid to late September right what is it like up north we usually are getting our last ones around Labor Day. Really? Okay. But I've had individuals um, that just came, pigged out, and just kept going. It was just they needed a little bit of a pick-me-up. Um, in a few times in the second half of September and once October 16th. Uh, that's the latest hummingbird. That was probably a baby from Canada whose mother had a late nesting, and it just took that little guy longer to get ready to go. Thank you. Sure. Laura, I've wondered about the, um, I love the story, the fact of the chickadees sort of branching off and joining a new flock, the babies. And I wonder if any other birds do that as well. Seems like a good strategy. Uh, some birds, like Baltimore Orioles, don't learn their dad's song. There's somebody in the waiting room. I wonder how long. Oh. Is. I hope he hasn't been there long. I hope you weren't in the waiting room too long, George. But um, uh, what was I talking about? before I saw the waiting room. Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, Baltimore Orioles. Uh, the babies learn the song of their new neighborhood. So males, they hear their dad singing, but they don't pick up his song. They wait until they settle in the neighborhood and learn the local song. And they have these cool little dialects because of how they <laughs> pick up their songs and it, when I figured that out I was a pretty new birder living in Madison Wisconsin and I learned the Baltimore Orioles songs of Picnic Point the place I birded all the time and then in spring I could identify when I heard an Oriole singing I know oh that one's gonna stay oh that one's from somewhere else he's gonna leave and it was really cool um. Hmm? Oh, Laura? Yes? Can you hear me okay? I can't see myself, so. <laughs> are, you, are you Jennifer's iPad? Yes, <laughs> yes I am. <laughs> um, I'm in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and I had a song sparrow feeding a cowbird baby this year. Yeah, the uh, song sparrows are one of the major birds stuck raising baby cowbirds. Margaret Morse Nice was a researcher who wrote the definitive life history of the song sparrow. And she found every time a cowbird lays its egg, it throws out one of the song sparrow's eggs. So that automatically decreases her productivity by 25% if she was going to lay four eggs. But what Margaret Morris Nice found was that just about always at least one song sparrow survived and very often two or three also survived with the baby cowbird. Mm -hmm. 
Now that is not true of some other species, but song sparrows apparently do, you know, I mean, it's tragic that they lost that one egg, uh, but they managed to make the best of it. Uh, there's a, a bird called a black-capped vireo that nests in a few places, at Fort Hood in Texas, a few places in Texas, and then up in Oklahoma in the Wichita Mountains. And that's a critically endangered species. And the babies, are very tiny. That's North America's tiniest vireo, but they also have a very long incubation period. And the cowbirds have a very short one. So baby cowbirds are not the least bit aggressive to their brothers and sisters. They're not like European cuckoos that push the other eggs or chicks out of the nest. They're not like that mm -hmm. at all. But cowbirds pick tinier species. And the, so the cowbird's going to be the big bruiser. The parents recognize their eggs, including the cowbird egg. And I don't know, they maybe think, oh, maybe this guy's going to be, you know, a halfback for Notre Dame or something. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. But they feed the baby that seems hungriest. And unless the cowbird's stuck, stuffed, he's going to always look the hungriest or she, because that's going to be the biggest baby in there. But with the black cap vireos, because they're so big and because they have several days advantage of growth before the tiny black cap vireos even hatch out, those baby vireos often just get trampled into the nest. Mm -hmm. The cowbird didn't do it on purpose, but they don't have a clue. Good. Thank you. Sure. Does but the cowbird it, ever ne have a nest of its own? No, they used to, um, no one knows how nest parasitism started. And there are relatives of cowbirds who never associated with large mammals. But here in America, cowbirds always stayed with bison. And they got their food, uh, they, they feed on disturbed soil. And we're, when we're talking about the prairie, prairie grass is tall, but beneath the grass are decades and decades of dead grasses that make this thick mm. mat called prairie sod. And cowbirds needed that to be broken up to get to the dirt, which all they had to do is follow a bison and with their big mm -hmm. clunky feet, they would break up the prairie sod. And also the cowbirds could take ticks off their back or if flies were landing on them, they could eat those bugs. And so they followed the bison everywhere. The trick is because they only knew how to get their food when bison were there, if the bison moved on, how could the cowbird survive, much less feed its babies? But by figuring out, or somehow, nobody knows how it started, but by laying their eggs in the nests of birds who knew how to get food without following the bison, mm -hmm. they they survived and everything was cool until people not only wiped out the bison, which normally would have wiped out the cowbirds, but we started developing, having farms and all kinds of things that disturbed the soil anyway, and we brought in a substitute, cattle. And, the, and the, that's why we call them cowbirds, because the first experiences with them that early naturalists had in America was with their cows. Hey, Laura, I have a, a Blue Jay story for you. A short one? Sure. In my my favorite kind of story. <laughs> I know. I thought they would be. Um, I live near a very large park, and every year there's a, a Cooper's Hawk nest in the park. Now, this year there's also a red-tailed hawk nest right in an urban neighborhood. And I noticed the Blue Jays doing what they often do. They've done this year after year. They'll imitate a Cooper's Hawk when they're near the feeders and things. Mm -hmm. But this year, I've heard uh, several young blue jays imitating 
the hunting call of red-tailed hawks, which is just blows my mind. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? Um, uh, yeah. Now, they, uh, they sometimes figure out to use their imitations as a strategy to get the other birds to clear out of the feeders so they can come and have it themselves. Blue jays tend to be not very aggressive while they're eating, but they have to get into the feeder first. And like when I got, um, uh, I took some pictures of my grackle in my feeder today and the blue jays wanted to be in the feeder and they could not figure out how to get that grackle out. If they can imitate a hawk or something and banish the birds that way, that's what they do. And so it's kind of a, a, a cool thing. One November day, when it was actually warm enough in Duluth that we had our windows open, I started hearing a baby crow. Baby crows do that, ah, ah, rather than the raspy caw. And it was this baby crow. And their voices have changed by November. And I ran out to my porch, and I couldn't find the crow anywhere. There was a blue jay sitting there, but I didn't pay any attention to him. And I went back in the house. And a few minutes later, I hear, ah. Ah, and I charge out, and there's no crow, but there's a blue jay. So the next time, I kept watching out the window and watch the blue jay inflate its throat and be making that imitation. And I have no idea why it tried to make it in the first place, but once it figured out that it was getting me to charge out, it thought, oh, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had an education blue jay for many years named Sneakers, and uh, he or she, I usually gave her the benefit of the doubt and called her a she, but Sneakers could make a perfect whistle, and once when I was gone overnight, Russ heard me talking. I said, hi. And he thought, she's not supposed to be back. It went in, and it was sneakers. <laughs> and um, the, the closest we could figure out over time was that she wanted to hear my voice, and I wasn't there. So she did the next best thing. And I didn't figure out that that's why she was doing it until she died. Uh, oh, her other word, she said, was, come on, come on. And I figured out that was because I was rehabbing and I was specializing on nighthawks. And to get them to open their mouth, you have to tease them uh, between the beak, uh, the upper beak and lower beak. The tissue is so soft and fragile. And I'd be going, come on, come on. And Sneakers figured that out. But she could say hi and come on, come on. Well, I had a second blue jay with her that I still had when Sneakers died. And BJ had never said a word. And all of a sudden, BJ started saying, hi, come on, come on, Mim mimicking not me, but Sneakers, because she missed that sound. So they can use their imitations for different reasons, but they are smart birds and they figure out that if birds don't want to hear a sound and they'll leave the feeder, why don't we make that sound? Okay. <laughs> Laura? Yeah? I was, uh, this is Suzanne. Uh -huh. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, um, how are the house sparrows where you are? Do you, are they, in, uh, are they decreasing population? Are you having any luck in keeping them from feeding at feeders and hogging everything? I live in Duluth where they, there's virtually none in my neighborhood. Our houses, yeah, it's bizarre. If I go downtown or to Canal Park, where there's a lot of tourism and restaurants and things, there's house, plenty of house sparrows there and in the harbor area, but none 
in my neighborhood. I haven't had a house sparrow in my yard in several years. One winter I had a few and whenever my, when my children were little, I was home all the time. It was almost like we were in a pandemic or something. But so I would notice every little thing going on. And whenever my neighbors came home, they didn't have a garage and they'd leave the car out. And the moment they were gone, the house sparrows went under the grill of their car where the engine was still warm. And they would stay there until the engine cooled off and then they'd come out. And I thought that was really cool. They remind me of the street urchins in, um, in you know, a Dickens kind of artful dodgers. <laughs> but they can be so awful when you're trying to do bluebird houses or if you're just trying to feed birds and not wanting to subsidize the riffraff. I love house sparrows because when I was very little, we had, and I lived in a really unhappy home and it was violent and loud, but the house sparrows were always outside our apartment and then in the shrubs when we moved to a suburb of Chicago and they would just be cheeping away. And it was like they were, it was like, the Waltons, before I ever heard of the Waltons, they were <laughs> telling each other all their adventures about the day. And I just loved hearing them. So as I became a birder and started realizing that they really don't belong here and that they really cause ecological damage, I've taken that under advisement and I completely sympathize with, I mean, those poor bluebirds, the house sparrows are violent, uh, mm -hmm. starlings too. And I love starlings for different reasons, but they, they don't belong here. And it's such a problem because they are here. And an equally strong case could be made that most of us don't belong here because mm -hmm. we're not native either. <laughs> so <laughs> That's true. And a lot of us cause a lot more ecological damage than mm -hmm. the house sparrows do, but it's, it is a real problem. And so I'm not trying to make light of it, but mm. it, yeah, it's. Their behavior, their behavior is just so uh, aggressive. It's almost like they uh, get around in a, a ring and, and watch a, a, a street fight and but, birds are like, trying to kill each other. But the house sparrows are usually really nice to each other. And uh, the fathers are so nurturing for the babies. They're kind of xenophobic and they don't approve of other non house sparrows and they can really fight to take over a nest cavity. But they're pretty peaceable with each other. So there's that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Any other topics we want to bring up tonight? Laura, this is Mary Alice Smith. I started putting out um, grape jelly for Orioles, and I just had an Oriole festival going on in my backyard. I had uh, orchard Orioles uh, coming just recently with young and um, I only stopped feeding when the um, hawks really picked up on the fact that my yard was full of Orioles and they kept doing flybys and I was thinking I didn't want to witness that so I took in the feeder. Yeah um, you don't want to subsidize um, mm -hmm. you know if you're gonna I mean like I like hawks they're birds and their mind a bird feeder yeah they're feeding on birds there. But on the other hand, if we're inviting the little birds to come to our restaurant, um, it's the height of bad manners to invite, you know, the mob in to come shoot your guests at your <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> so, it, um, so, yeah, it's a, a, a problem. I also tell people to stop 
feeding jelly to Orioles or other birds, if their young are coming to the, uh, to the jelly too much during the day, two or three meals aren't gonna hurt them. You know, it's like jelly sandwiches for children. But it's uh, not a good thing when the babies are getting too much jelly rather than other food. And some parent Orioles are better than others. I, uh, one of the baby robins that I raised one summer, I got because it had horrible rickets because the parents had apparently there were just a whole lot of buckthorns that summer and that poor little baby, its parents must have just found a lazy way of just feeding it berries and it wasn't getting any of the other nutrition that it needed. Mm -hmm. So every now and then bird parents can be as poor as human parents. Mm -hmm. And babies can have a sweet tooth because some of those Oriole babies, I swear, were there morning, noon, and night. So that was another reason I took it down. Yeah, and they can't help it, and it tastes really good. But the other alternative, if you still want to be giving them some jelly, is just to bring it out and then take it in again that day, um, or just to offer a fairly small amount and not keep refilling it until the next day. So, Laura, I've done a, uh, taken a different approach with the Orioles. Uh, getting for more into the summer, I tried putting out mealworms, live mealworms, for the first time because I've started to grow them, but I had problems getting them to take the mealworms. I started putting them in the jelly, in, in a jelly feeder. And what I found was that the Orioles would always take the mealworms first uh, out of the jelly. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Sweet insects. What, what could be better than that? <laughs> they get all the flavor of the jelly and all the protein of the mealworms. Um, I've never heard anybody do that deliberately, but it's pretty clever. I felt a little bit guilty for the, for the mealworms. It wasn't the nicest thing to do to the mealworms, but... Oh, now, I had a chickadee one winter with a badly deformed bill, and all the, the easiest way for that him to feed, and I know this one was a male, though I didn't know it at the time, he would sit on my hand, grab a mealworm, he'd have to put his head upside down and kind of hook it in the upper long, long bill, and then kind of work it in and keep mashing his head against my hand, and it's so gruesome <laughs> but what we do for our children there was one time when i was a rehabber and had a saw wet owl the mite i got some frozen mice from our bander at hawk ridge but i swear they were actually small rats they were enormous and this was this little teeny tiny owl so I had to be like the Jeffrey Dahmer of the bird world and cut up <laughs> these poor <laughs> little dead mice. And um, one time I was, uh, I would cut them usually into thirds or I would cut them in half and quarter depending on how it went. And I was cutting up the front half and he grabbed the back half at this huge midsection where I'd sliced it in half and he opened his mouth so wide it was so bizarre and then he had to ratchet it down and I you know when I talked to the high school kids I say he didn't inch it down he didn't even millimeter it down he sort of angstromed it down it took him forever <laughs> to get it so he got the whole thing and his as it came further down his throat, his head was pointed up and I had to stand right there. I was so afraid he was going to choke on it. And he finally gets it. So the only part sticking out is the tail. <laughs> and then he makes a big swallow. And this was after a couple of minutes of just being immobilized like that. And he makes a big swallow and the tail just sort of disappeared. <laughs> And he looked at me like, I told you I could do it, Mom. <laughs> uh. 
So any Laura, other quick, yeah? Yeah, Laura, um, this is Becca. So oh, I hi. have a question about wood ducks and mallards. So my mm -hmm. husband built a wood duck nest this spring and we've had wood ducks come in in the spring and fall only. And, and that's been fine. They have no place to stay. They wouldn't stay in a wood duck house that's not built. So he built one. But I was wondering, do wood ducks get along with mallards? It, because my pond is really small. And if the mallards have been there for several years, and they've, which they are, and I've had one or two or maybe even three sets of mallards have their babies and families there would they would a wood duck feel threatened by the mallards and never come and nest in that wood, box, wood duck house i don't think so i used to bird when we lived in madison wisconsin i would go to picnic point and there was a a pretty small uh, a lovely little marsh right there on campus with a pond. And we had um, mallards, blue wing teal, and wood ducks all there. Uh, the wood duck mothers, they just, it struck me. I don't know how, whether this was just an anecdote of one small group of them or what, but they never left their babies. Every, and they would swim by and you'd hear the mother going, ruck, 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 and the babies just stayed with them. Where the mallards, the females would go off, the males were nowhere to be found anymore by the time the eggs hatch, but the females would go off and either talk about soap operas or gossip or something, and the babies, maybe it was the mallards presage the view or something, but they'd go off and the babies would just be milling around and be confused for a while and then the mothers would come back. But the wood ducks never left their babies that I could tell, but they also totally got along. So I don't think that would be a problem. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You might get... Oh, uh, you might get hooded mergansers nesting in the wood duck box, too, because they also use wood duck boxes. Okay, Don. <laughs> hey, uh, this would be uh, changing topics, and maybe it's too big for this, but I was wondering about, I started doing some field recording, and I was wondering what kind of field recording gear you use. Um, I'm actually going to be doing a podcast about it because I just interviewed Don Krudsma and we talked quite a bit about it. So I'm going to have a long extra podcast episode about it. But what I use um, is I have a Zoom H6 recorder. Okay. And uh, this has uh, built in a stereo microphone. It's what they call an XY. So it's got two directional microphones that sort of make an X. One's getting the sound from that way and one's getting the sound from that way. And that's what I've used for most of my spring recordings in my yard. I just use this and I just set it in a Tupperware container on a tree stump and so it's pointed sort of up in the right direction and it does my recording. But I can also, I have a directional mic that's pretty long and mm -hmm. I don't know if I can pull that out. And I also have a parabola with a, a unidirectional or omnidirectional mic that goes in the middle. The parabola uh, magnifies the one sound you're pointed directly toward. And so you get the least amount of peripheral noise with it, but you have to be aimed precisely at the singing bird. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing Don Krudsma uses when he records. The directional mic, and I have a pretty long one now, that one mag uh, doesn't magnify sounds. It just picks up best in the one direction you're pointed at, and it reduces the rest of the sound around it, but you still are getting a lot of ambient sound. And both of those hook in to this unit. I could be recording on different channels all at the same time with this, so I love my little recorder. 
<laughs> Thank you. And I have gotten a couple of really good recordings with my old iPhone. When I was down in uh, eastern Oklahoma for a birding festival during my big year, we took a field trip to see Swainson's warblers. Mm -hmm. And the, the naturalist with us told everybody she was going to play a recording and get the mail to respond. She led fee three field trips that weekend. Each of them she took to a different mail. So she would only disturb them once. And she said she was only going to play the recording once. So we had to be paying attention. But she told us right where the mail was going to come. And sure enough, he did. There was no wind. And, for, and I asked everybody to just be quiet for three songs. I should have said four because people started stirring during the third song. So I should have said four and then I would have gotten three good ones. But I was just, the only thing I had was my iPhone. So I had it pointed and I got a really nice recording. And then last year when my husband and I went to Florida to the Keys, I, we found a mangrove cuckoo and I was focused on pictures but I wanted a recording too so my husband held up my iPhone because that's all I had and I got a, a really nice short recording of a mangrove cuckoo with it so but you can't get the quality with a with a cell phone that you can with professional equipment right. what Thank do you use well I started out with a Tascam dr05 and then I added a, uh, what is it, a, a Rode NTG microphone. And now I just upgraded my recorder to a uh, Sony D10. So, and I just started using it today, frankly, so I haven't even listened to it. Uh, when uh, Susan, who I can see up there, and I went to Panama last year, and when we went to Costa Rica a couple years ago, I uh, I had this recording recorder in Panama. I had a Minolta one when we went to Costa Rica. But I often would leave it at our room when we went to meals and uh, have it recording like from the balcony and get sort of the ambient sound. And I love doing those. I never thought to do it in my own backyard until I was stuck here all spring going stir crazy but i'm really surprised at the quality of some of my recordings i just love having them on in the background i have them on my web page at lauraerickson.com at the top there's a bar and one of them is miscellany and if you click on that the top thing is Laura's ambient bird songs and those are the longer ones that turned out sort of good or pretty good okay great I'll check that out thanks mm -hmm. Laura I have to leave but I just want to say thank you this was um, very interesting oh I'm glad you came thank you all okay. for coming and thank you all for supporting my work <laughs> that's been really wonderful <laughs> Thanks a lot, Laura. Thank you, and thanks for being the person admitting everyone, Paula. I finally figured out how to do it. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, Laura. Bye-bye. Bye, Liz. <laughs> I see you there. <laughs> well, there's George, the last person that came. <laughs> oh, Lori Gilman. Hi, Lori. I see names. <laughs> Not all of them, but some of them. Laura, I have a cedar waxwing question. Uh huh. I had a recent um, friend of mine send me a picture of a fledgling cedar waxwing with an orange tail. Now, yeah, it's I know a that's dietary diet. thing. Yep, I know that's diet, but what would change the diet to make it an orange tail? I don't know. 
I really am not sure which berries. I do think that some of them are from Eurasian uh, honeysuckle. Okay. And I said to myself, I said, it looks like a cedar waxwing baby, but it has an orange tail, so I'm not quite sure if it is really a cedar waxwing baby. <laughs> but thank you very much. Sure. Laura, I wondered if I could ask a quick question. I, I was trying to get in earlier. Um, uh -huh. If you have a small area and you want to plant a tree, Mm -hmm. and you would hope to get cedar wax wings or whatever else, what, what would you recommend for a, like a dwarf size or mid-size? Would it, would be? it would mostly depend on what time of year you want to have the berries. June berry or service berry, um, you can get those as small trees or as shrubs and the small trees oh the waxwings just love them my very finest cedar waxwing pictures are taken at Juneberry but they also come in the fall up here at least to uh, mountain ash is a very good one and that's not a very big one either mm -hmm. so okay. mountain Mountain ash or Juneberry, but they would have the berries at entirely different times of year. Right. So the fall would be for the mountain ash, but the um, Juneberry was in? In June, July. July June. up here. Oh, no wonder they call it Juneberry. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't right. it funny, though? We don't think those things through most of the time. I know. That's okay. I know. Thank you very much, though. Thank you. Sure.